Okay. Theoretically, this is live. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll see if YouTube refreshes. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah. yay. All right. So, we welcome to uh, the Frosty Drew uh, live stream for uh, February nineteenth. Um, this is my first time pushing all the buttons, so I apologize that we're uh, about ten minutes behind. And also, um, I was looking at the other screen. So I wasn't looking at you guys. Um, and we actually had a little dry run because we thought we were live, but we weren't live. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna try this again. Um, so tonight, uh, obviously, it's cloudy. Uh, at least it's snowing where I am here in Connecticut. Uh, I think it's also snowing uh, in Rhode Island at Frosty Drew. Um, so we are going to present um, some of the things that are in the night sky using some. Um, digital planetarium software called Stellarium, um, which is what you can see I'm presenting now. Uh, the kind of the uh, the idea is we're just going to kind of go through some of the highlights of the things that are in the sky tonight um, and things that you can see this time of year. And Scott has joined us. Excellent. <laughs> um, so I've got Stellarium here. Uh, I'm going to have to look at this other screen to give you this. So you're going to look at the side of my face. Hopefully that's okay. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to start with is we've got Mars here. Uh, Mars was recently in the news because um, the new NASA rover uh, Perseverance touched down. Um, so that's really exciting. We have now two rovers from NASA on the planet again. Um, Curiosity is the other one, and it's been there for a number of years. Um, other things nearby here in the constellation of Taurus. Um, we've got the Pleiades, which is a tight collection of seven stars. And then right next to that is the moon. Um, if you go outside later in the week, the moon's going to be much further to um, the east. And it moves to the left um, over each night. And then next to uh, the constellation Taurus, we have uh, Orion. And that you can you know, find with the three bright stars that are referred to as the, bright, the belt stars. And then the upper left shoulder and the lower right foot are fairly bright as well. And those are um, Betelgeuse and Rigel. Um, zooming in a little bit, the top right shoulder and the bottom left foot, um, Bellatrix and Scythe. I, I never know how to pronounce this one. You read it all the time um, and you never know how they're pronounced. Um, and then below the belt is probably one of the most interesting objects in the winter sky is the um, the center of the Orion uh, Nebula, and it's actually several nebula uh, clusters together. So you've got the main um, Orion Nebula here, which kind of looks like a, when you're looking at it with your eyes um, through a telescope, you don't see the red color or the blue color. Um, in a particularly large instrument, um, the 16 inch I've seen blue, but it's been a very, very dark night that that um, happens. And it's also very hard to tell the difference between blue and gray. So I could be um, misinterpreting what my eyes are showing me there. Um, and then above it, we have um, what's known as the Running Man Nebula. And it, in this picture on Stellarium, it's kind of hard to see. But when you're looking through a telescope, there are two uh, dust lanes through this reflection nebula that look like um, somebody running. Um, and then below Orion, you have um, Canis Major, which is uh, the brightest star in that constellation is Cirrus. Um, and that's one of the brightest stars in the night sky. Let's see what else is interesting around here. Uh, we've got Gemini uh, to the um, top left of Orion. So Pollux and Castor are some of the, the two brighter stars that you use to find that constellation. Sorry, I'm trying not to zoom too much because it is a little laggy. Um, and then let's see, going further to the east, um, we've got Leo coming up. Um, and then in a little while, or later this year, we'll have the Alenid meteor shower. Uh, and then one thing that's really neat about Leo is right behind it and then kind of around it, there's a lot of galaxies. Um, below Leo's back leg here, um, there's a grouping of, of, of galaxies called the Leo triplet. We commonly show that um, in the yard telescopes within the Frosty Drew campus. Uh, usually you can see these two quite brightly. These are, uh, this is M65 and M66. Um, this one's much dimmer. It's an NGC galaxy. 
Um, but it does show up on a good dark night and it's really, really cool to see those three uh, galaxies together. Um, and then there's a few more galaxies on the front end of um, Leo. Um, these two were interacting. They're also NGCs, there, which typically means they're quite a bit dimmer um, and they weren't spotted by Messier when he was putting his list of Messier objects together with he and his colleagues back in uh, the 1700s. Apparently I'm doing a good job, Scott left. I'll take that as a, I'm doing a good job. And then we've got, um, this is kind of looking towards the Northeast. Um, the Big Dipper is, you know, basically pointing straight up um, in its earlier winter time position, it's laying down on the horizon. And I find it very interesting when the Big Dipper is laying down across the horizon, it looks absolutely like gigantic, um, just because you get um, the visual compression from the way your eyes perceive things, um, it, it, it grows because the horizon is there to compare to that constellation. Uh, and then later this summer when, you know, the Big Dipper's up here directly overhead, um, pretty much it's gonna, it, it appears much smaller. Uh, and then we also have the Little Dipper. Um, and if you've been to Frosty Drew, you'll know these two stars are the pointer stars that you can find, used to find um, Polaris, which is the North Star. All right. Um, let's see, keeping going around a little bit more. Um, Scott's back. We've got Cassiopeia, uh, which in the win in the summer is on the other side of the sky for the this northern part of the sky. It actually revolves around Polaris, so these constellations stay up all year. They're called they're circumpolar as the term for that type of constellation. And the further south you go, the lower Polaris gets in the sky. Um, so you have less and less circumpolar constellations. And conversely, the further north you go, um, the higher Polaris gets in the sky and you have more and more circumpolar constellations. Um, Frosty Drew is about 41, 42 degrees um, in latitude. Um, so we're you know about halfway if you consider 45 degrees halfway. Um, going around to things that are starting to set and kind of back to our starting point, um, you've got Pegasus here, uh, the big square in Pegasus. And that one is usually um, we use to find the Andromeda galaxy. And then to a lesser extent, the Triangulum galaxy, which is here to the left. Draco under the Big Dipper. Yes, that is Draco. And Draco, this time of year, is kind of hard to spot because these stars get lost in the haze of the light pollution. Um, it's it's much more um, easy to identify in the summer when it's closer to the zenith or directly overhead. Okay. Uh, let's see. Going around. All right, so that's kind of a sky tour going all the way around once. And then if we look straight overhead, um, you've got the Cap Capella and then Aldebaran in uh, Taurus, which is the bull. Um, so um, from there, I have a couple of pictures um, of M45, which, is the, or which are the Pleiades. Um, M42, which is the Orion Nebula, um, and then a couple of other things that I thought would be interesting to look at. Um, we can, I was going to bring up my uh, M31, um, some older um, Andromeda Galaxy pictures um, as well tonight, uh, but I figured I'd offer the floor to Scott, see what he's got in store for us. Well, Derek, let's do this real quick. Can you take your Stellarium version or your screen and bring it over to the constellation Hydra? Let's see. I get lost in these programs. <laughs> <laughs> so you go go jump ahead for into another week. Oh, another week. Oh, you want me to, yeah. to so do some time warping? Yeah. 
Go to the twenty. Go to like the twenty ninth. Let's do that. Ten days. Twenty ninth. Uh, last year. Yeah. Right. Twenty set. Twenty six. Sorry. <laughs> it's not leap year, guys. <laughs> All right. And then jump ahead until like maybe midnight. All right. All right. There we go. Now that bright star, you guys. So Derek can point out where Hydra is here. And Hydra is really a rather large constellation. It's currently the largest constellation in the star lore that we adhere to, which is largely Greek. And the brightest star you're going to see along Hydra right over here is called Alphard. Right about there. Now, just below Alphard, right where Hydra kind of planes off, over the next two weeks, we're going to see through this region a really fabulous asteroid called 99942 Apophis. And this is, so it's going to reach its closest point to Earth on March 5th. And it's not going to be all that close with this time. We're talking about maybe 0.3 AU, which is like one third of distance of us from the sun. But what's notable about this is that this is Apophis's last relatively close pass to us before the very close pass, which will occur in the year 2029 it's like april 16th i think now we can see apophis starting this week and through the next couple of weeks in our telescope like a little star moving across the field and for those of you who are older than maybe 20 years old you may remember that back in the late 90s and early 2000s apophis was all the the buzz because back then we, we thought it had a pretty high probability of actually impacting earth in 2029 and Apophis is big. Like, it's not like the, the Chelyabinsk meteor that happened over Russia. Apophis is about the size of the Empire State Building in New York City. So if we were to be impacted by Apophis, you know, it's, we're not going to go running like the dinosaurs did, but it would definitely be a rather catastrophic event. So it's not going to impact us. We don't have to worry about that. We've understood it's orbit a lot better and there is no longer an impact threat though in april 2029 it should be naked eye visible as it passes us and it will pass so close that it will pass inside the ring of of uh geosynchronous tele uh, satellites that we have around earth so we're going to try to look at apophis as often as we can over the next couple of weeks in the frosted Drew telescope and then gear up for 2029 so while we had this up, I wanted to make sure we pointed that out because that's it's a pretty big deal. And since Apophis has been kind of moved off the list of, you know, terrible things, it's kind of fallen off of uh, just the overall media radar. And I haven't heard a lot about it in the last couple of years. So I'm going to pull up a couple of pictures and videos here of the moon. So tonight at Frosty Drew, if it wasn't snowing and it was clear, we would be looking at the moon. And it's really quite a good view when you're looking at the first quarter. Tonight's moon is first quarter. And first quarter is when the moon becomes about half full from our point of view. Now, after this, I guess a good way to think about first quarter too is before the first quarter, we are in the crescent phase of the moon. So it's the what we call the waxing crescent. After first quarter, we're in waxing gibbous. And a gibbous is not like the crescent shape of the moon. It's more of that almost fully round shape with like a crescent missing from it. During first quarter, the sunset line called the Terminator sits right in the center of our view of the moon. And that Terminator, that sunset line is always the best place to look at the moon because you get a really fabulous view of some of that detailed lunar terrain. So let's see if I can present this window here real quick. So no, let me load this up into a, a tab real fast. Okay. We're gonna do first. So this is the this is what the first quarter moon would look like. And this here, this line is, this is a terminator. So this area of the moon is in complete sun or sunlight. This area is all in nighttime. 
And during this time period, sunlight will shine on the moon from this direction. So everything over here is in direct sunlight. But right over here, right on the Terminator, sunlight is shining across the lunar surface and it's allowing shadows to get, ca get cast. And you can see some really great shadows in here, right along these mountains over here, right, this is right along um, Archimedes Crater on the inside, Plato Crater. And that gives you a really accurate view of the rigorous lunar terrain because you get depth of field, right? Now, this is similar to what tonight's moon would look at, but during the first quarter moon, you get some really interesting features that come out. Now, this is a little bit beyond first quarter, but when first quarter sits through this region here, you end up with a couple of interesting little, I guess, pareidolia, you know, objects that really aren't there, but we think we see them. And in this case, we call it the Lunar X and the Lunar V. So I'm going to show you guys the, a video of the Lunar X, which is right about here is where we would be seeing the Lunar X if we were actually looking tonight. Let me load up this video real quick here. One second. I'm a little bit behind my game tonight. More, more network stuff, because remember that, Cox, right? Okay, so here we go. Don't worry, we're getting data caps on Comcast. I've heard, terrible. Okay, here we go. So this is um, an image or a video that I captured during the first quarter moon. And all these craters you see in here, these are really rather insignificant craters. They look dramatic because they're along that, that lunar terminator, right? But in this case, you can see this little feature right here. And that's called the Lunar X. Now, the Lunar X is really just, you have a crater here, and you have a crater over here, and you have a crater right here. And this crater is called Warner Crater. Some of this is referred to as the Warner X. And the very edges of the crater are much higher than the inside of the crater. You're looking at the crater walls. And because sunlight is shining across the surface, it's catching the top of those craters, but not catching inside of them. And it's forming this little X in here. And we call this the Lunar X. Now, this is actually a video of it, but the image that came from this video looks like this. And this is the Lunar X right here. And this is, gives you a pretty good idea of what we'd be looking at tonight. Now, along this region as well, if you, so let's go back to that first quarter moon, right? In the first quarter moon image, you can see just a little bit further up. you have this feature right here. And right in this region, these craters all have a tall rim on them that form what we call the lunar V. Now to get the lunar X and the lunar V in one night is a little tricky, but we had a good opportunity not too long ago to actually do this. And this is a video that we captured of the Lunar V. It's coming. There we go. So what we're looking at right here is a lunar V. And this sits right on the edge of Maria Serenitatis, Maria uh, Tranquillitatis, and then Mar Imbrium is up over this way. So this is Serenitatis, this is Tranquillitatis. It's down over this way is where the Apollo 11 landing site is. And you're just looking at a series of craters in here 
that are sitting. So you got a crater here. You have a crater right here. And all of those craters are generally sitting above the. You transitioned to VLC somehow, Scott. Yeah, let me I don't know if the jump video back ended. over here. I will relaunch it. You seeing it now or no? Pull something up at first. <laughs> let's see. Is that now? Well, let's do this. Instead of showing a video, let's show the image because the image is just as compelling. So in this image here, this is the V right here. And you can see a lot more of the surrounding features. You got like, this is a crater. You got like, see a little bit of edge of this crater here. You can see this nice indentation here. And I'm trying to see if there's any subcratering in the area. I don't see too much. But, you know, we're looking at, this is right along the center of the moon along that Terminator region. So on a night like tonight, we might have been able to see the lunar V. And these are some, these are kind of like astronomy, like geek cred is a good way to put it. You know, how many, have you seen this as an astronomer? Is it on your life list, so to speak? Have you seen it? We have a lot of uh, team members, notably one named Ernie Evans, who is all about that that list of geek cred. You know, have you seen the the Lunar X? Have you seen the Lunar V? Have you seen the pup around Sirius? You know, that's all we, it's all we ever talk about when Ernie's around. And if you haven't, then you get an earful from him. But a good way to kind of look at all these is to take a look at the actual, the entire moon. So, in this case here, so here is the entire moon captured during the harvest moon. This is when the moon's full. And you'll notice that at this point, that terminator that's running right through this part of the moon tonight, where we're seeing all those really great craters in here, and you hardly even see them at all. But if you wanted to find the lunar V, you would have to look into this area right over here. This is where the lunar V is. And if you wanted to spot the lunar X, the lunar X is over in, I believe it's over in this region right over in here. You can't even spot it when it's not on the Terminator because all the craters that make these up are really rather insignificant. They're just part of the cratering of the moon. I mean, they're not craters like Copernicus crater right here or Kepler crater over on the corner over here. And this up here, Aristarchus. These are ray craters. These craters are young. These craters are dramatic. I mean, looking over here at, when you're looking at Copernicus crater, I mean, this thing's a monster. This crater is about 60 miles in diameter. It has a substantial amount of ejected matter around it that's still visible from the impact I mean, we're going back about 139, maybe 140 million years here. And that sounds old, but it's actually quite young when you think about the age of the moon. I mean, the moon is pretty much as old as Earth, 4.8 billion years old. So these craters are young. And you got these little mountains in the middle here, right? These little peaks in the center. These are bounce back peaks. It's kind of, think about throwing a rock into like a pond or a river. And you get the splash out, you get the ripples, and then you get the bounce back from the center. The same thing happens when you have impacts on the lunar surface. And that middle will bounce back and form a little mountain in there. This range of mountains inside here are taller than Mount Washington to give you an idea of the scale that you're looking at. So if you were to stand in this part of the crater, it's around here, you wouldn't say, yeah, I'm in a crater. You would feel like you're in a valley and looking out in a distance in every area around you, you would see these huge mountains. And what you're looking at is that intense crater rim. Now, Copernicus isn't the only ray crater that we see on the moon. Tycho is the most notable ray crater right down here. Tycho's rays extend out to over two thirds of the lunar surface, which means that when this impact occurred, it ejected matter lunar material over two thirds of the moon. Now, another really interesting thing about Tycho Crater, I mean, it's got all the characteristics of a ray crater, right? You got the 
the splatter everywhere. You get the big rays coming out of it. You have the sharp rim. You got the little peak in the middle. But what's really notice notable about Ray about this Ray Crater about Tycho from the other ones is this ring of dark material around it here. So that's similar to looking at you know the the Maria. You know, like you got like Maria Humorum and you got Maria Imbrium over here. And this is Maria Serenitatis and Maria Tranquillitatis. These are all really old impact craters, like impact craters that are 4 billion years old. And when these craters occurred, the mantle of the moon underneath the crust, underneath the surface was all molten. So it was like magma underneath the surface, lava. And when those impacts happened, it cracked open the crust and all that lava pulled back in and it dried on the surface. We call that a basalt region. But what you're looking at is a higher concentration, in this case, of iron and magnesium, all of which reflect less sunlight than the surrounding lunar crust material. But these heavier elements sink down towards the center of the planet the same way they would in a glass. Take a handful of dirt, drop in a glass of water. The heavier stuff goes to the bottom. All the dust and lighter stuff sits on the top. Same thing happens with planetary evolution, right? But when this crater happened, the impact was so dramatic and went so deep that it actually scooped up some of the lunar mantle beneath the crust and blasted it into the area around the crater and deposited it on the surface. And that's why it reflects less sunlight. That would have been an amazing crater to see happen. Now, when you think about these impacts and you think about you know, the lunar surface being so banged up like this. The question comes to mind, you know, how often do we see this happen? So as far as recorded history goes, we've recorded, uh, I believe, two visible impacts on the moon. And we never found impact craters for them. And the moon doesn't really get hit with objects that create craters like the Sinus Aridum Basin over here, or Plato Crater, or Archimedes Crater. Now we get craters that are not craters. We get little objects. Instead of asteroids, they're like meteorites. And instead of leaving large impact craters on the moon, they chisel away at all the impact craters that are there today. And it slowly flattens out the moon and kind of erases all those really great features. Craters like Copernicus and Kepler, like Tycho down here, these craters are young enough where they haven't been subjected or had so much of that chiseling going on. But really old craters like, like Mare Serenitatis and Mare Tranquillitatis and even Sinus Aridum and Plato Crater, Maria Crisium over here. These craters have been so exposed to that level of chiseling that they don't even look like craters anymore. Now they just look like different regions on the moon. Like look at this guy right here. A withered shell of its once great self, right? So... But this also raises a question too. So the moon is one sixteenth the mass of Earth. It's one fourth the size of Earth. Obviously, it's not the master of the Earth-Moon relationship. So how come the moon looks so beat up, but Earth looks so sexy? If you kind of think about this, you got you to think about Earth. So on Earth, we have, we have two very important things that are going on. One, we have active geology occurring here. We have molten mantle. And we all live on tectonic plates that are floating around on that liquid mantle. We also have a very dense, very active atmosphere that we love to abuse. And both of these things are constantly resurfacing the planet's surface, constantly recycling. So Earth does get hit a lot. It gets hit more than the moon does, more bigger, more, more massive. But the surface is always resurfacing. I mean, you can just you can test this just from just from tidal forces alone by going to the beach and sticking your foot in the sand. Rip a load of tide line and then watch the next two or three wave cycles erase your footprint. On the moon, this doesn't happen. The only resurfacing that occurs on the moon, it's not from an atmosphere. There's no, there's no atmosphere on the moon. There's no active geology on the moon currently. The mantle on the moon is no longer molten. It is the inner mantle is semi molten, which is more like a hot clay. The only thing that resurfaces the moon are other impacts. So craters last a much longer period on the moon. So let's see here. 
So Brian Kelly has put out a question. He said, earlier you were talking about an asteroid that decades ago was feared to hit the Earth. If that asteroid hit the moon, how large an impact crater would we expect? So Brian Kelly is one of our team members. If you guys have been out to the observatory, I'm sure you've met Brian out at the, usually he's standing outside the door of the observatory dome, laying the smack down with the law. But Brian's a great guy. And Brian's got a good question. So if it did hit the moon, we would absolutely see that impact occur from our point of view. Though, would it leave a large crater? It would leave a crater that we could find. But I really don't think you would see it leaving a crater like Copernicus or Tycho. I mean, you got to think about it. These craters is 60 miles in diameter. Apophis is 0.25 miles in diameter. And that's along its semi-major axis, which is the long, it's like kind of the very oval. It's along a long axis. It's, it's that size. I think you would see a very small impact crater from our point of view formed. But it would be awesome to see. And I wouldn't envy the moon for experiencing it. All right. So what else do we have in my fine little collection here? Here is, well, let's take a look here. This is actually an image I kind of pulled up the other night. It was sitting around in my archives, and I kind of forgot about it. And what we're looking at here, let me switch over real quick. I have a better way of doing this. I just got to remember it. I've gotten lazy using Zoom at, at my, my, my jobs. I got to get used to using this again. So here we go. This is something I found sitting around my archives. And this is from maybe about a year and a half ago. What we're looking at here is a conjunction of Jupiter and the waxing gibbous moon. Now, this moon here is, looks like it's maybe about one day, maybe two days past first quarter. So this is what the moon's going to look like over the weekend. And what's really awesome here is that we actually have Jupiter in the frame. And you can actually see on Jupiter you know, some of Jupiter's markings. Let me get it over there. It doesn't want to show us Jupiter. There we go. You can see Jupiter's equatorial bands. You can see Jupiter's four Galilean moons. It's interesting in this context, not because you can see Jupiter and the moon, but because you get an idea of how much area in the sky Jupiter and its moons will take up compared to the amount of area that the moon will take up. And it's a bit wider than I think you would experience. And also, if you think about this too, so the moon, the moon is about 200 and roughly 236,000 miles distant from Earth on average. But Jupiter is about, we're talking upwards of 90 million miles from us. I mean, that's a big difference. But yeah, Jupiter you know, it maintains its size out here. It definitely can hold its own. Give you an idea of how large Jupiter is. And a good way to think about it is the distance from the sun to us is about the same distance as Jupiter is from us. And the distance that Jupiter is from us is about the same distance that Saturn is from Jupiter. So those distances in the solar system are very, very big. And we get so used to seeing these charts where you got like the sun and then Mercury and Venus. Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. They're all like in this close quarters next to this gigantic sun. But that's not really what it would look like. I mean, these, there is so much space out there. And that is comforting when you think about things like Apophis and the possibility that these impacts could occur. You know, there's a lot of room out there. So, Derek, did you want to – you anything else to show or talk about for a little bit? Um, I had some older images from kind of the sky tour that I gave this uh, earlier so I could – put those up and we could talk about, um, I was going to talk about how they were captured and kind of what, what they're showing us. So. Yeah, let's do that real quick. And then in a little bit, I'll show some of the work I'm doing on the coma cluster. How about you, Bo? How are you guys doing? 
We're good. Yeah, we're doing good. You know, we're hanging in there. Uh, wish the wish there was a little bit clearer skies. You know, yeah. so we can actually enjoy uh, enjoy the nights. But I guess that's New England for you, huh? Yeah, we miss you guys. That that's it. You know, it was a couple weeks ago when I showed up down at Frosty Drew to get ready for the Friday night program, and Mike and Jessica were already there. And I get out of the car, and I see Mike and Jessica just kind of standing out there at the end of the walk. And I walk up to them like, they got snow here. Because up here in Providence, we hardly had anything. And there was a significant amount of snow on the ground. And, and Mike is like, yeah, I didn't expect this. And then we're rushing to, to scoop out all the snow. And we found this old bag of rock saw in the basement that was completely solidified into one oh. giant piece of saw. And we're throwing it on the ground and stomping on it and breaking it up. It was the most ridiculous thing ever. But we made it work. I mean, New England astronomy, right? Yeah, I know. For real. That's how you got to do it, too. You just got to take the big thing of rock salt and just smash it and just spread it out. And hopefully that melts the snow instead of, instead of shoveling. You know, it's the easiest way to do it. A blowtorch would be nice. Yeah, that's what we need, blowtorches. Jet engine. Yes. Yeah, stop, I'll stop messing around. All right, <laughs> so I'm going to do a uh, present from my um, – this computer, maybe – Screen. All right. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is an image of the Pleiades um, that I captured a, a while ago. This is this one's from 2014, um, but this one was captured over the course of probably a couple of nights at Frosty Drew. Um, back when I first started doing astrophotography um, and it uses just a normal, you know, point, point and shoot camera that had a ring adapter that you could put on it to attach it in a rigid fashion to the telescope. Um, and then I ran a custom firmware um, that you can download from the internet for a Canon. Um, I actually forget the name of it these days, uh, but it allowed me to do manual exposures, uh, which the camera software didn't um, allow for. Today's cameras are significantly better than what I was using back then, um, and you can do a lot of cool things um, with them. But I thought this was kind of a good way to show like what you can capture with you know, you know, pretty basic camera gear and a telescope. Um, and this is probably ten images at two minutes a piece um, stacked together in um, a program called Deep Sky Stacker, and then processed in Photoshop. So you can see each of the um, the seven bright stars, these two over here that are close together, and then um, you've got the three across the top and then the two down here. And the, the actual like starburst pattern comes from the optical characteristics of the telescope. This one was captured using a Newtonian telescope and those spider veins that um, are in the front of the telescope that hold the secondary mirror cause those diffraction spikes. Those are some amazing diffraction spikes you have there. Well, that's what you get when you uh, over-process. But I think one of the things that's really cool, um, the stars up here in this corner, they actually have an extra diffraction spike from the focuser tube. Really? That's from your draw tube? I think that's from the focus tube because I, I couldn't come up with a reason why it wouldn't be in all of the stars. I was looking at that and I was wondering why you were getting a little extra diffraction there. Yeah. You know, I personally like diffraction spikes because I feel like, you know, you're taking all the combined, you know, so whether you have a refractor, which doesn't have diffraction spikes because it doesn't have anything in the, in the path of the, of the light when you it's still all the same amount of light regardless of whether you have an obstruction or not so when you get these diffraction spikes what you're doing is you're taking a lot of that starlight and you're spreading it out along the diffraction spike and it actually reduces the amount of starlight that's in the center and it gives you a better view from what i can tell of the star itself instead of just that big overexposed blob you'll get with a refractor right and one of the other neat, uh, one of the other things that comes out in photographs of the Pleiades is the actual nebulosity of the dust cloud 
um, that's associated with the Pleiades. And what's, what I find fascinating about this dust cloud is that it's, it's, it's completely like, well, right now they're together, but they're not of the same origin. The dust cloud has a completely different velocity component than the stars that are currently reflecting off of it. So in you know a few hundred thousand years, the Pleiades may have moved out of this dust cloud and we won't have this beautiful reflection nebula um, to associate with the Pleiades anymore. That's really awesome too, Derek, because this is, all, this is a visual example of how open clusters like the Pleiades break up. And there's a lot of different events that could do it, but one of those events is a hydrogen cloud, which in this case is what we're seeing, a nebula, moving through the cluster and disrupting the gravitational balance of that cluster. Now, for a while, we thought that this might have been the nebula that the Pleiades formed out of. And as Derek was saying, when we actually started measuring the velocities of these objects and their proper motions, we realized that this is just passing through the, the open cluster. So the next one I've got is um, an image of both the um, M42 Orion Nebula and then the one that's next to it, which has an NGC designation that I don't remember at the moment, um, but that's commonly known as the Running Man Nebula. Um, this data uh, was collected as kind of a group effort with another astronomer from Frosty Drew, um, and then I did some processing on it, and this is kind of where we landed. So this is a, a newer camera, um, a, um, a full-frame uh, mirrorless on the same type of um, mount, but this is a refractor telescope with a wider field. Um, the telescope that took a pic the picture of um, the Pleiades here, um, if we took a picture of the Orion Nebula, it would be, you know, a square. It would, you know, kind of the field of view. Well, that's not dragging very well. The field of view would be kind of like that, much, much closer into the Orion Nebula. So to get the wider field of view, you have to use a telescope with a, a shorter focal length. Um, I think this one was in the four to 500 millimeter range, whereas the image with the Pleiades was taken um, at roughly a thousand millimeters, but it gets weird because of the way that that camera coupling was done. Um, and then this region of the Orion Nebula, which is in this image, it's kind of overexposed. Um, there's a group of stars here um, called uh, the Trapezium um, that is really a fun target um, for astronomers to look at because there it's four stars that are extremely close together and getting them to resolve individually uh, takes you know a good night with your equipment tuned correctly and it just kind of is a way to show that uh, you have really good skies and um, your telescope is tuned up well so that you can objectively measure how your telescope is performing instead of just kind of looking at a single star in um, and trying to do it based on that, based on the shape of that star. Because based on how your telescope is <laughs> collimated, you can get with, you can get, you know, football shaped stars, you can get stars that won't focus, you can get stars that, you know, do weird things where they have like blobs hanging off the side of them. You get all triangle kinds of shape. Weird, you get triangle <laughs> shapes. You get all kinds of weird shapes um, if your telescope's optical arrangement is not taken care of, and that that happens. You know, you you you, know, you carry your instrument, you set it up in the field, and you know, all of a sudden, and, you know, it's just not doing what it's supposed to do, or the temperature changes. You know, all kinds of things knock them out of whack. Um, but you know, it's it's not a hard skill to learn how to um, to keep them tuned up, but it is something that you have to come up with ways to recognize that the, the telescopes are in need of that type of maintenance. And some designs are more susceptible to that maintenance uh, than others. Refractors are very good at not needing that maintenance. They, they're good at holding their collimation, whereas a Newtonian does require that um, maintenance quite often. All right. Um, and then last year, um, I started a project um, of trying to catalog all of the Messier galaxies. 
Um, and I started this project, well, because of the pandemic. Uh, we were stuck at home. <laughs> this is May of last year. Uh, so this is two months in. And it really had, you know, a lot of time because we weren't going anywhere. Um, so this is the two primary Messier galaxies that are part of the LEO triplet. Um, this is M65 and M66. Um, and you can see where the one on the right here is kind of has like a disrupted spiral uh, formation. Um, and the one on the left has kind of a more uniform spiral formation. Um, and they, they are close enough that they're gravitationally interacting. And the component we don't see here, which is the dimmer um, NGC galaxy, is also disrupted and kind of has like a weeble wobble going to it, um, which is pretty interesting in and of its own right. Don't know. I might have a picture of that. Let's see. It's probably not as good. Yeah. So it's a little bit lower um, quality, but you can see. Uh, the NGC galaxy on the, the right of this picture, uh, the dust lane doesn't seem to line up with the primary axis of the gas in that galaxy. So there's probably been some interaction between these three um, over the years. Let's see. I could throw up, speaking of galaxies, I could throw up my coma cluster data if you want. Yeah. Let's check that out. Well, this is getting into galaxy season. Yeah, and, we, and now's the time to do it because I feel like we get so clouded out during the the actual springtime when galaxy season is at its height that we almost miss it every year. I wrote today in the newsletter that I feel like it's a common discussion amongst the team how we're out there checking out the sky and then we get this crazy cloud out over the next month or so. And then when we step back out there closer to the summer side, it's almost like we missed an entire section of the sky. And that's not just because of the clouds. It's also because the sky advances or nothing advance any, any faster, but because the days get shorter or the days get longer, the nights get shorter. You actually start feeling like the sky is advancing quicker. All right. So here is, the coma cluster right here. So the coma cluster is a series of galaxies that are all clustered together in the constellation Coma Berenices. Can you see it, Derek? Yep. So this is the very first data set of a larger project that this is part of. And this is about the furthest I could bring this at this point until I get more data on it. And it's not clean data either. You notice you got a lot of glow on the edge here. This is called amp noise. This is the sensor in my camera picking up some of the infrared light that's being produced by the electronics in the camera. It's just heat, but the sensor can see an infrared, so it picks it up. I have enough data to remove all that. I just haven't applied it yet. But the coma cluster, what we're looking at here is this entire region. This is not visible to the naked eye by any means. And... It's in the, it, you're looking at a collection of about 1,000 galaxies. And the heart of this cluster resides at 321 million light years distant. But let's take a look here. A closer look at this region will show us that at, when you're zoomed out, you see a pretty large elliptical galaxy here, another one right here. You see a, a face on spiral galaxy here. And you see some galaxies sitting out here. But what you don't realize is that the closer you look at this, the more you start realizing that every star in this image is pretty much a galaxy. These are all galaxies, elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxies and lenticular galaxies. This is, look at this, this is a fabulously barred spiral galaxy right here. And I noticed something interesting here too. So, Take a look at this. So this is a very large elliptical galaxy right here. And this is a, this has got a lot of mass. I mean, you're talking a substantial amount of mass, substantial amount of gravity in this galaxy. And this is directly in our line of sight of galaxies that are on the other side of it. But if you start taking a look here, you start noticing that some of these galaxies around it share a very similar like view. And I would argue at this point 
that we may be looking at copies of the same galaxy. And this is only one galaxy that's on the other side of this. And the light is being bent around the galaxy to form copies of it. And that would be, if that is what's happening here, that's known as an Einstein cross. And due to relativity, you know, light is vulnerable to gravity as well. You'll actually see copies of galaxies behind a very high mass galaxy. I'm wondering if that's what we're seeing here. Now, hmm. when we get when I get more data in this, we'll be able to start observing all of these galaxies out here with higher resolution to see what's going on. So this here, this looks like a lenticular galaxy, which is a galaxy that has recently merged and is now, it's not a spiral, it's not an elliptical, it's kind of in between. I mean, galaxy, galaxy, I mean, it, this here, I took this, this image with a telescope that brings up a field of view that's probably about the size of your, maybe the size of your thumbnail at arm's length in the sky. And that's this entire region. And you're looking at over a region with over a thousand galaxies in it, just in that thumbnail. And that's from what we can see just with a small telescope out here in Rhode Island. And this image is just very fascinating to me. I could spend the entire night just sitting here looking at it because even though you got the brighter galaxies here, and then you got some of the dimmer galaxies around this field, that's a star, around the field here. But then if you look close, you even have dimmer galaxies out here. Galaxies that are actually just barely peering through right here, right here. I mean, you got some irregular galaxies in here. And this is just an example of the sheer dispersion of galaxies that are it's in the visible universe. I mean, you think about it, each of these galaxies here are just as many stars, if not more, than the Milky Way has. Some of them a little less, some of them a little more. Just in this cluster alone, if every galaxy had just one planet with intelligent life on it, There'd be a thousand intelligent civilizations just in this image. So, but those that are into the uh, the aliens thing, that's something to think about, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as as I progress through this, this is this time of the year we want to be working on this. So, as I progress through this image, we'll be showing it as often as possible because I really want to start bringing out detail in some of these distant galaxies that are in it. And we're also, though we won't be necessarily looking at this with the telescope at Frosty Drew because these galaxies are all just too dim to see looking at it with your eyes. We will be looking at a lot of galaxies that are around the region that this is in and being able to spot some really excellent detail. Like this one here, we might be able to get a good view of this galaxy right here. And like Derek was dealing with, I have diffraction spikes as well in here because I use a telescope that's called a Ritchie Cretion telescope, which is the same general idea or design that the Hubble Space Telescope uses. We have a mirror in the back, a parabolic mirror, so it's like a bowl. And then in the front of the telescope, you have no lens, but you have two supporting brackets, or actually four, it looks like two, that form an X like you see on a Newtonian, but in this case, instead of holding a diagonal mirror, they hold a convex mirror, which is like uh, the opposite of a bowl. So it's like, like looking like this and here, which direct the light back towards the primary mirror and through a hole in the center and out the back. And along the inside edges of the telescope, there's baffles, which reduce stray light, which is why I don't have a lot of glare around my diffraction spikes. But what you're looking at here are the brackets that hold on the secondary mirror. And that's what brings out that, that X shape. So we're just after eight right now. You guys ready to wrap up? You got anything else? It looks like we had a question. What do we got here? If one question about the, another question about the trapezium. Um, how close together are they? Um, they are all, they all form together. 
um, and Scott might be able to give a better answer. I don't. I, I know they form together, um, and they are still, you know, gravitationally interacting. Um, many of the stars that are within the Orion Nebula uh, are still, you know, evidently within that region and interacting. And in fact, the shape and the the structure of the Orion Nebula is mostly because um, those stars have formed. Uh, to the point where their stellar winds are starting to push the gases away from the regions that they are formed in um, and thus opening the space up so that we can see into the nebula and see the stars. Um, as far as like how close together they are in miles or light years, I do not know offhand. So to add what Derek has said, the, the overall diameter of the entire Orion Nebula, which contains the trapezium stars, is 25 light years in diameter. So those trapezium stars are quite close to each other. And we're talking within a couple light years of each other. Close enough where their gravity is definitely interacting with each other. And they definitely are connected through gravity. But like any bully in the playground, the trapezium stars may look really big and beefy and bright right now. They will not last very long because eventually that brightness is going to catch up to them, and they're not going to outlive the next stage of their stellar revolution. There's another question here, too, from Mike again. So the high-mass galaxy bends the light from the galaxies behind it, which makes them appear around the high-mass galaxy. Yes, it does. So think of it this way. It's almost, it's, it's called galactic lensing. So when you have a, a, like I'm talking a high mass galaxy and we're talking something like the Milky Way here. We're talking like, like an elliptical galaxy doesn't have a lot of, you know, nebula left in it. It's a lot of just very old stars and it's very large. You're talking trillions, hundreds of trillions of stars. What happens with these galaxies is they're able to bend light around that galaxy kind of like when you look at a simulation of a black hole and you see the light bent around it and that's pretty much the light from the accretion disk on the other side that you see the what this can do is it allows us to one see galaxies that are further away than we would normally have been able to see be, due to the lensing effect but depending on where the galaxy is on the other side of the high mass galaxy we could end up seeing copies of the galaxy on different sides of the high mass galaxy because the light path that those photons follow you could they could follow around one side of the galaxy they could bend around the other side they could bend around the top and around the bottom and you could end up with copies of the same thing additionally you can also end up with a very distorted copy of it just one copy that loops all the way around the high mass galaxy and we call that an Einstein ring. And galactic lensing is actually a really big tool that we use today to observe objects that are further away. And we also use galactic lensing in a lot of dark energy research as well. Do you have anything else to add, Derek? Um, just on the, the last bit there with the dark energy, um, why it can be used for that uh, research is because dark energy still exhibits a gravitational component. Um, so if we can account for all of the mass visibly and then the equations don't balance, something needs to balance that equation. And that's where the dark energy um, theory has come from, in part. Right. You know, the, it's what, what are we seeing? We, we can account for only a certain percentage and it's on the lower side of all the the gravity we see, we can we can see. So what's where's the rest of this energy coming from? And that's dark energy. So, well, we are a little late tonight, but we had a, another rough start. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to continue to do live streams on a weekly basis, like we said last week. We really want to try to kind of mix the live streams in with the on-site events as well. So we have both of them happening together with a fallback to just a live stream on the nights where it's cloudy or snowing or raining 
or pandemic lockdowns prevent us from being out there, whatever the case is. But we are trying really hard to get back on site. And we're hopeful that over the next month or so, we do get a few Fridays that are nice and clear so we can get out there and really rock the sky again. So if you guys learned anything tonight, had a good time, please visit us at frostydrew.org slash donate and hook us up, get us through our down season. And we will be happy to see you guys either on site next week or online. So have a really great weekend and a great week. And anytime you get a clear night, step outside and take a look at the sky. See you later.